from Serbia and based in Serbia. Uh, and uh, I will, I guess, introduce our project to you and talk a bit about the process itself and a bit more about the chemical and biochemical aspects of uh, everything that we are doing. Uh, Barkat? Uh, hi, my name is Barkat Singh and I am working as the International Relations Coordinator uh, with Nikola based out of India. And our take on the project is essentially to promote the social impact aspect of sustainability and encourage people to, to go towards a greener alternate to single use plastics. And that's essentially what we're focusing on on the Indian side of our project. And I have Nihul working with me out of Oroville to support in that endeavor. Hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to connect with you all and to share our work at SOMA and uh, about mycelium technology and its impact on a sustainable industry. And uh, while myself and Bhavkata are taking charge on the India chapter of things, uh, building a community in rural entrepreneurship, uh, Nikola is heading the company's vision back in Serbia. And uh, I guess with that, I'll let Nikola take this forward. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I would first like to play a short video uh, that's going to introduce kind of our idea and values, and then we can go into further detail. If there's any problems or you can't see or hear anything, oh yeah, you can't share uh, sounds. I remember now. Doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, White Lemur was started uh, and Project Soma within the company uh, because the world has begun to drown in plastic. And uh, yeah, you can see the title. These problems have spurred legal action against single use plastic. However, there are no cost effective alternatives currently on the market. White Lemur Project SOMA brings the solution Biosporin, a green substitute for styrofoam. Biosporin has all the technical characteristics of expanded polystyrene. It is light, durable, shock absorbent, and is a thermal insulator. In addition, Biosporin is completely biodegradable and inflammable. Biosporin is produced from agricultural waste in a circular process without any <coughs> wastewater and using 98% less energy. The production process is carbon negative. By successfully commercializing one ton of Biosporin, we are effectively reducing pollution by almost 9 tons of CO2, 3 tons of methane, 300 kilograms of microplastic, and 150 kilograms of ash. Biosporin degrades completely in natural environments after three to six months and produces organic fertilizer where it degrades. Biosporin's physical qualities, environmental impact, and biodegradation have all been independently confirmed and proven by numerous universities and institutions. At the moment, we are commercializing biosporin in two classes the economic class, meant for single-use packaging, and the premium class, meant for production of sustainable yoga equipment. The markets we are attacking are poised to grow significantly. Consumer trends and regulative actions fuel a considerable growth in the sustainable packaging sector. Our mission is to produce the material as cost-effectively as possible, so it can easily replace biofoam and single-use products. That's where the biggest impact is to be made, as all single-use disposable items should be cheap and biodegradable. Our team has a wide range of experiences, covering everything from R&D to product commercialization, especially when bringing innovation to the market. Our team and their products have received several national as well as international awards and recognition, most prominent among them being the Technological Innovation of the Year 2020 Award by the Serbian Ministry of Science, Education and Technological Development. Join Project SOMA on our quest to make the world a healthier and greener place for us all. 
Okay, that I hope gave you a little bit of a background on us. So uh, basically, <clears throat> when we started off with uh, SOMA, uh, we actually started producing a wide array of pharmaceutically active and medicinal mushrooms. Uh, we didn't uh, target the biodegradable sector, uh, so to say, from the onset. Uh, but during uh, our production, we noticed that a uh, very large part of the waste from uh, mushroom production, uh, basically it can be any kind of mushroom production, but uh, most specifically from uh, Ganoderma lucidum uh, or the reishi mushroom, has uh, certain qualities when it's treated and dried in a, in a certain way, uh, has physical qualities which are similar to styrofoam and can have some technical characteristics similar to styrofoam. And after noticing this, we actually saw that it wasn't a, a new discovery as such. It had been known since the 80s from several research papers. Uh, it, we then discovered that you know it's something that kind of fits the, uh, the public trends and the consumer trend and le legislative actions against the uh, single-use plastics, so we decided to also pursue that uh, aspect of our work. And slowly over, the, over several years, as we developed our technology, uh, it spontaneously evolved into a more and more circular process, where we now have a almost completely circular uh, production methodology that's not only circular, but also leads to carbon reduction and is zero waste currently. So uh, as uh, you've seen from the video, we generally believe in a sustainable and green future and uh, we are poised to use any kind of technology to get there, especially biotechnology. Uh, here we can see the illustration of our entire uh, production cycle, uh, beginning with the upper part and the production of the mycelium itself and the biomaterials and the secondary productions of uh, mushrooms, uh, pharmaceutical extracts and uh, production of chitin and chitosan for use in uh, biomedical technology. Uh, I will walk through this, this process uh, in, a, in a general way. So uh, everything begins with uh, agricultural waste and uh, our process uh, which is a bit different from most of the other uh, micro-materials uh, on the market currently, uh, is based around the principle of being as uh, cheap and cost-effective as possible. Uh, for instance, we have um, in the US the biggest player, Ecovative, uh, whose technology is based on using uh, composites made from partially from agricultural waste, but partially from hemp fiber and other materials. Our process is based on using homogenized uh, lignin based or cellulose based agricultural waste from multiple sources. So our process can basically, uh, with homogenization and processing, turn most types of vegetative uh, waste into uh, nutrition material that we can use to grow mushrooms and materials. So uh, from the waste that is uh, homogenized and processed, it is then inoculated with the desired type of mushroom, uh, which then is uh, either produced as a material directly or used to uh, fruit the mushrooms themselves, which are then used further in the process, or both in some cases. Uh, as uh, you've seen on the video, Biosporin, our first and main line product from our, our cycle, uh, is the, our contendent for the micromaterial markets, and it's a biodegradable polystyrene substitute. Uh, it's, uh, in addition to all the technical characteristics of the polystyrene itself, it's all, also completely biodegradable and uh, inflammable. Uh, it's, uh, as we said, produced from agricultural waste completely, so no resources are used to create it that have additional value. Uh, 
the production process is carbon negative and uh, it biodegrades into organic fertilizer. It's not a complete fertilizer, it's partial. Uh, it uh, doesn't uh, have enough uh, nitrous or nitric compounds in itself to be uh, a complete fertilizer, but it does increase the nutritional value of soil in which it degrades. And it does leave behind carbon captured in uh, detritus in soil. Uh, utilizing the uh, characteristics of uh, biosporin, we are naturally attacking the single-use packaging market. Now, this is something that's uh, rather difficult currently at uh, the market, and none of the players currently existing have been able to uh, target uh, the market with a cheap enough alternative. Uh, so they have all turned mostly to uh, commercializing it through premium aspects such as floorings, uh, acoustic panels, or uh, more premium uh, packaging. It, of course, it is certainly an option to, to go into market with that kind of approach. But our uh, vision is that if something is single-use and disposable, we should make it as cheap as possible and biodegradable. And that's the way to achieve the biggest impact. If a product can penetrate into the wide use market, so if it can be used to package everything that, you know, you, you, including te technology or uh, machines or furniture that we throw out daily in, in millions of tons, then the biggest impact can be achieved. Uh, we, there is a lot of interest in the market for using our material as uh, either isolation for the building industry. Uh, actually, around 65% of inquiries we get are from the building industry. However, this is not something we focused on uh, because the logic of using something biodegradable in the building industry is kind of defeats the purpose and point of the key features of the material. So if it's biodegradable, it should be used for single-use products and not for building a house that's supposed to exist for you know a, a couple of years at least. Uh, per one ton of uh, biosporin, uh, in total, so calculating the entire life cycle of the product and comparing it to the entire life cycle of a styrofoam product. So if one ton of uh, biosporin replaces one ton of uh, styrofoam on the market, we have uh, effectively pr uh, prevented the release of almost nine tons of CO2 around three tons of methane, 150 kilograms of ash, and 300 kilograms of plastic waste. Uh, but this is taking into account the entire process of also production of styrofoam and removal of styrofoam from the, from the environment. Uh, as I've already said, it directly biodegrades. So biosporin is not compostable as most other eco-packaging is, uh, it degrades in natural conditions. However, the natural conditions for the degradation of biosporin include uh, bacteria from the soil and high moisture. Samples that are kept in dry or in uh, storage facilities in dry conditions and not touching the soil uh, can last, well, the oldest sample we have right now is four years old, so up to four years at least. Uh, when it comes into contact with soil uh, and wet conditions, the bacteria from the soil start degrading it. So in soil, it degrades in three to six months. Uh, as we've already uh, seen in the, in the video, one of the pre more premium aspects that we are uh, aiming to bring to market is uh, Soma yoga equipment or yoga equipment made from biosporin. Because simply it kind of makes sense that uh, one of the main props for yoga shouldn't be produced from unsustainable and unhealthy materials. Because yoga should be healthy for the mind, uh, for the body, but also for the environment. Uh, we were also working on a, on a project in a way to integrate uh, natural seeds within the yoga block itself and within the uh, biodegradable packaging so that when it degrades in the environment, it can also uh, basically jumpstart the process of uh, greening or reforestation. Of course, this carries with it a lot of questions and insecurities because uh, some cultures might not be adapted to certain climates or they could turn uh, as to an into infectious species and so forth. So there's quite a lot of nuances with this, but it is, it is a concept that we are working on. Uh, 
so aside from the production of biosporin, the uh, second part of our, our production is utilization of every other uh, stream from that production, which includes the mushrooms themselves, so the mushroom tissue. Uh, I will focus now on the aspect of uh, Ganoderma because that's the one that we're using mostly for creation of biosporin, although this same cycle and approach can be used for most types of uh, lignus mushrooms. Uh, the uh, first product we get out after processing and extraction is chitin, which we are then converting into chitosan. And I will go a little bit after this, I will go a little bit more into detail about this process because it's the most related, I feel, to the, to the topic of this um, talk, the green chemistry aspect. Uh, and uh, we are also producing uh, organic mushrooms as such, which can uh, be sold in dried extracts or spores. And uh, finally, we are uh, we have a pharmaceutical branch which is producing currently uh, capsules and uh, tea as uh, health supplements based on uh, organic mushrooms. Uh, this part, uh, Barkat will speak a little bit more of uh, in a minute. Uh, I will just transfer to a more technological talk about uh, chitin and chitosan themselves. So uh, up until now, uh, most of the, not most, 99.9% .9 of chitin and chitosan in the world come from uh, the fishing industry. So uh, a little background on the material itself. Uh, I'm sure most have probably heard of it or know what it is. Uh, chitin is the second most abundant natural polymer in the world. It's right behind cellulose and it's the main building material for the hard parts of uh, mushrooms and uh, arthropods. So the shells of arthropods, the bodies of insects and the bodies of mushrooms are all made from the same material, which is a natural polymer called chitin. <coughs> chitin uh, <coughs> has a very high global demand and it's, uh, I'm sorry. <coughs> and uh, as I said, most of it comes from uh, utilizing waste from the fishing industry. So the shells of Crabs, lobsters, uh, shellfish are processed in a very uh, dirty process chemically. Uh, those factories are usually based on the shores of seas or uh, of fishing countries. They release a lot of uh, waste into back into the water. They release a lot, a lot of chemicals into the water. And uh, the product is also tied to lands that have a strong fishing industry which makes it uh, its production limited to only a certain number of countries. The rest have to import. And uh, the product is ultimately non-vegan. So it comes from uh, an animal source. Uh, chitin and this derivative chitosan are used across many industries. Uh, in agriculture, they're used as stimulants for plant growth and plant immunity. So when they are used, uh, when they're sprayed into the ground and on the plants, they elicit uh, an immune response from the plants. Uh, this is probably due to the uh, plant having inbuilt uh, immune responses to the invasion of uh, fungus or of any kind of molds or similar uh, diseases. So it uh, elicits an immune response from the plant and basically vaccinates it against uh, molds and similar diseases. Uh, it can be used as uh, uh, basically a binding block to uh, make time-release fertilizers for use in the ground. Uh, it can be used in the water and waste treatment industry to build uh, filters and uh, reduce odors and uh, clarify solutions. Uh, it has a use in the nutritional industry. It's used both as a dietary fiber, as a binding agent as a thickener, as a preservative, and it's also commercialized as its own uh, supplement for uh, certain aspects of uh, cholesterol reduction and uh, some uses in, in diabetic, uh, diabetic uh, situations. 
uh, and it's used in the cosmetic industry for a whole load of different different functions. And um, maybe the most interesting and most high tech use is in uh, the biomedical industry and biomedical sector, where it's used to produce uh, skin dressings for wound care. It's used to produce artificial uh, tissue scaffolding and matrices. And it's used right now, there, there is uh, research going on to produce uh, certain kinds of uh, reabsorbable, uh, biocompatible uh, components for bioprinting, something like cartilages or parts of, uh, of joints. Uh, so it's a very, very versatile material with a lot of different uses. Uh, but another source, as I said, in nature exists, which is fungi. However, the entire um, industry for produ producing chitin from fungi is very ineffective as of this moment. This comes because the, most of the production of mushrooms deals with the production of gourmet mushrooms, which are then consumed in their whole. So we don't extract something from them and leave the chitin behind. The chitin is eaten up with, their, with, with the mushroom. Uh, however, that uh, industry also has a very, very large amount of waste. For one kilogram of mushrooms produced, there is three to four kilograms of uh, mycelial waste. Mycelium also contains chitin in, in, a, in a smaller, uh, smaller amount. So we are currently working on a technology to uh, produce uh, chitin and chitosan in a green way, so as green as possible, greener way from both uh, mushroom production waste and uh, the waste that's left behind after extraction from uh, pharmaceutically active mushrooms. So when we produce effectively, in an example, when we produce the reishi mushroom, we have the uh, body of the mycelia of the mushroom. Part of that is used to produce biosporin. Another part, which is not suitable for, for biosporin, can then be used in this process to produce, to extract chitin from it. And the pulp we uh, get from after the extraction of the uh, pharmaceutically active components, which are beta-glycans in, in the case of the reishi mushroom, we are also left with more chitin, which we then intend to, to purify through this process. So the process is basically uh, centers around two phases. Phase one is the extraction purific and purification of, of chitin then uh, followed by alkaline peroxidase uh, treatment, uh, enzymatic hydrolysis, uh, and in the end it's uh, solubilized, centrifuged, and uh, finally amino acids and carbohydrates are removed uh, from the solution, leaving behind chitin. Uh, one, one more advantage uh, as compared to chitin production from animal sources is that uh, Producing it from mushroom sources doesn't require the uh, special step for deproteinization because the chitin in mushrooms is not uh, tied in the same way to proteins as it is with the uh, arthropods. Uh, phase two is the conversion of chitin to chitosan. Now this, here, this step is uh, still in an experimental phase uh, with us. And uh, we are currently experimenting with three different approaches. Uh, one is a thermal me mechanical process uh, using a steam explosion to uh, decompress and convert it. Uh, another is a method using deep eutectics, which are which can be regenerated almost ninety nine percent, making it a, a much greener process. And the uh, final approach using uh, hydroxide and ultrasonic waves to uh, achieve the the uh, conversion. All of these processes are mostly, uh, all, all of the components in these processes can mostly be regenerated, which get, which leaves them a much greener process than, than before. Uh, so as I said, the, the advantages of this process would include uh, both the price and location of production. So it would allow production in most countries that have climate that can produce mushrooms, which is everything besides Antarctica, basically. Uh, it gives a higher uh, grade of the product, so oligopytosin can be uh, achieved in uh, longer uh, chains, which allows its uh, usage in, in the biomedical industry more. 
uh, it's uh, sourced uh, from a vegetable source, so it's not a, it's not an animal uh, derived material, and uh, the production process is much greener. And as I already said, the uh, material is uh, abundant. Uh, that would be it on the on the technological aspect of that production. Uh, so uh, I would just like to uh, say a few words on where we are with each of our our technologies and processes. So as I said, for the for biosporin, we are currently in the early phase of commercialization. So we have a few pilot projects ongoing for the uh, single use packaging. The yoga block is uh, should be on the market in the next uh, few months, so commercialized. Uh, and the uh, supplements and uh, the entire wellness branch is already in sale for, for a while now. Uh, Kite and Kytosan are currently, as I said, in a developmental phase. Uh, so we have already established the technology to extract it and are now working on the different approaches for the conversion of chitin into chitosan. Uh, the important takeaway is that from our entire process, so from the production of biosporin, uh, mushrooms, ext extracts, uh, and uh, chitin and chitosan, we have uh, almost 100% of uh, usability of all waste streams. So we have a almost completely circular system. So the only waste that we have right now is uh, some of the uh, thin plastic bags that we use in the process of the production of the mycelium. Everything else is either completely recycled or is completely reused. Uh, that would be it from my part. I would uh, give over the stage to Barkat who can now talk a little bit about the environmental, social, and uh, other impact aspects of our project. Hi, Nicola. Thanks. Um, so expanding a little bit upon what Nicola touched upon earlier about the, the diverse nature and the multiple utilities of our production process and the end products um, that we are generating. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Is my screen shared? Can you guys? Yes. Great. Right. So on the Indian side of our, our mission, what we're looking at focusing on is the largest problem that developing nations and the Indian subcontinent face, which is the trouble with crop stubble burning. And it is a major problem in the northern states of Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, and Punjab, where annually 20 million tons of agricultural waste is set on fire. Uh, and that contributes very largely to the global emissions and the country's CO2 score. Um, starting with this project, when I, me and Nicola first met, taking a slightly opposing uh, perspective to the project compared to where Nicola's um, approach is from the biochemistry and the technical aspect of the project, uh, we realized that there's a very large need for public involvement and an understanding in the public domain of what sustainability entails and what the measures to do the transition would essentially look like uh, and how we could apply our project to, to leverage upon that narrative. So beginning um, what Nicola shared earlier about the production and successful commercialization of biosporin and the carbon that is sequestered in the process, the methane and ashes per ton of biosporin production, we realized that we were eligible for carbon credits through our production processes. And the next thing we realized uh, was also a very demographic specific way of approaching the project because in a country like Serbia and developing countries, the uh, the availability of agricultural resource as a raw material that we use for our product varies and ranges from region to region. So for example, in India, the northern and the southern states have a large production of, of wheat, of corn, um, and the southern states have um, a lot of 
coffee, they have a lot of pepper, and we've been trying to experiment and see what different agricultural residues uh, could be used in a combination with our mycelium technology to see uh, and assess the characteristics of the end product. Um, and in the process, we, we, we spoke with a lot of farmers, we tried to assess um, the agricultural waste that we had available to us and how we could in, encourage them to get involved in the production process. And one of the things we realized that there is a huge, there's, there's a huge training and a capacity problem in a developing country wherein sharing a technology like this with uh, a rural community was a challenge that we found interesting and, and thought that there was a lot of space to get the local community involved, essentially leveraging upon create the creation of a local circular economy and promoting the concept of environmental social governance and the conservation of natural capital in the process. So essentially taking um, um, an impact oriented approach to the project and getting public participation um, when it came to the adoption of green technology. So when we look at the world of, um, of climate change, the UN has set in place various sustainable development goals and largely broken down into adaptation and mitigation processes. And we were trying to enhance the sustainability aspect of the project and, and see where we could get with that. So at present, we are looking at the world from the lens of carbon emissions and sustainability and what different governments around the world are doing in line with those steps. Um, developed countries are in a different position. Um, if we look from this graph here, um, on the extreme left, we, have, we can see um, countries that in the previous Paris Agreement in 2015, the pledges to um, undertake sustainable ventures and their roadmap towards acquiring um, net carbon neutrality by 2030 and then by 2050 targets that are put in place. Um, and we realized that developing countries are taking the lead in that with greater availability of climate finance um, and capital to, to promote young startups that are working in the sustainability space. Uh, whereas in developing countries like India and uh, the larger subcontinent, the, the opportunities and the understanding of, of such concepts was almost non-existent. So the core function of our project in India being three things, to promote the understanding of sustainability, encourage public participation and increase local involvement in sustainable practices, and developing a local circular economy driven at solving two problems elegantly and simultaneously, one being the issue of steering away from the use of single-use plastics, and the second being using uh, agricultural residue, which would otherwise be burnt and contributing to carbon emissions. And our solution of farming biosporin addresses both of these issues, where, wherein we use the agriculture waste to produce a product that replaces plastic, uh, single-use plastic, specifically protective packaging which uh, Nicola was talking about earlier. Um, so when we look at the world from that lens, uh, here is a model of, of, of what an entire circular uh, operation entails, the production, the treatment, um, the collection, the consumption, and of course the secondary raw materials that um, can be leveraged in the process when it comes to the making of biosporin, the chitin extraction, and the Reishi keys and capsules as direct fruit. So this is something we um, have been looking at, exploring, and uh, as far as the technical aspect, I guess uh, you know Nicola already highlighted all of that earlier. Wherein the technology is developed out of Serbia, and the way we are functioning is where we license the technology to Indian growers and participants who would like to. Um, get on board with the SOMA vision and promote a greener 
future and we're exploring collaborations with the state government of Punjab in the north and the Tamil Nadu state government and the Oroville Foundation um, as our partners to increase participation as the technology gets prepared and ready for use in Serbia. Now, one of um, the most interesting aspects to myself um, as an individual who's involved with society, um, I do com community projects in rural communities where I take on um, artistic endeavors to try and promote a social message. And one of the interesting things to observe in communities is that the problem or the situation has three layers to it. Let's say at the individual level, at the corporate level, and at the state level. The state level issues being things like regulatory um, um, application of regulations and the implementing of them on ground, which is something that is lacking in developing nations. At a corporate level, there are things like double counting. It is um, misreporting of emission standards and faulty reporting um, practices. And at an individual level, there's a lack of awareness or an understanding. So we look at the psychology of climate change and, and how these three layers of, um, of individuals approach the problem of climate change and their in sustainability within that context. And we realized that there's a blame game that, that kind of um, is in place. And one of our largest objectives with Soma Biotech Asia being um, the final point that I will get to at the end of this is a slight technology that we have developed called Soma Ecotech, which allows individuals to become financers and trackers of progress through green projects. Essentially, our motto being to accelerate green progress and facilitate climate finance. Um, but for that to work, we need the masses to get involved and to understand the problem. So here is how we want to drive people from where they are at the point where there is a lack of understanding towards wanting to contribute and taking ownership and agency to get involved. Um, finally, the combination of people, planet, and profit, um, addressing climate change and our endeavor to use art, science, and technology as a holistic blend to achieve that end goal. So from this illustration here, as we see, we have on the extreme left, the users, um, a blockchain D5 protocol, which I will not get into for the purposes of this conversation, because that's a altogether different domain. Uh, but in a one line summary, what we intent to use is the blockchain for storing the progress through SOMA value chains and allowing participants to uh, accelerate the rate and uh, mobilizing climate finance to green projects, namely the three, the four avenues of um, SOMA productions, our biosporin production line, our Titan production line, um, and the generation of our tea and mushroom products. Um, and as a byproduct of all of this, we generate carbon credits in the form of tokens, which are tradable with other green projects and on centralized and decentralized exchanges. So our endeavor essentially being to make value visible. And uh, the verification of carbon credits and standards that we're forming uh, collaborations with would allow us to develop SOMA into a responsible green project with its three verticals, the ecotech, the biotech, and um, the wellness product. And I think that essentially is an interesting visual of where we aspire to go with our green development and steer away from the present form of production, which is highly reliant on fossil fuel burning and the consumption of unsustainable raw material. So yeah, I think that essentially summarizes um, everything that we're working on within the Indian context of SOMA. And uh, we already have pilots underway where we're getting rural communities. Uh, you see over here, 
a collector for the agricultural waste coming from various sources, uh, something we were using as our pilot to test uh, and do our research and development. And uh, we essentially hope to get and spread this vision forward and get more people involved in uh, production of sustainable materials. I think that pretty much um, summarizes what we're working on on the Indian side of things. I think Back now we can maybe yeah. go to questions if mm -hmm. someone has anything to ask or feedback of oh. any kind would be appreciated. <laughs> I, I'm going to let the students ask questions. Do you guys have any questions? Um, I actually have one. Um, Whenever you talked about the pharmaceutical components of the mushrooms you had that glossed over, you talked about it more, I guess, um, in the middle about like how you got it out. But like, I'm wondering if there's any way that um, the pharmaceutical components could be pulled out of the packaging once it's like in a customer's or user's hands. Is there any way that you either could get a pharmaceutical component from that that somebody could use, or that you could get something that somebody could turn into a pharmaceutical component to be abused? Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, none of the mushrooms uh, contain any abusable <laughs> components. Uh, for, uh, secondarily, the uh, stream that goes into the production of biomaterial has uh, too low concentration of the pharmaceutical components. Uh, if it were any higher, we would have extracted it ourselves from the waste stream to add another layer, but it's uh, simply not cost effective. The concentration is too, too low. So when we compare the uh, body mycelia, so the, the body of the mycelia, to a fruit fruiting body of the mushroom per gram, uh, one gram of the fruiting body contains about the same concentration of substances as 200 or 300 grams of, of the mycelia. So the, the, the disparity in concentration is too, too big. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have two questions. Uh, are there any companies you believe that would be helpful in this process to collaborate with and that you're interested in working in? And the second one, is there anything you're currently researching that you can describe to us that you're excited to work on in the future? Thanks for the question. So. Uh... We are always open for ideas and collaborations and anything. I, I think we can, uh, you, you can Google us or we'll share our contacts afterwards. And we are always open for, for communication and any kinds of ideas for po potential collaboration. Uh, I guess I personally am the most excited about the uh, direction of uh, chitin and chitosan and specifically their usage in uh, biomedicine. Not in the least because it's it's my profession. I'm a molecular biologist and, and biomedical scientist originally, uh, before I went into sustainable industry. But uh, the idea of using those materials as uh, scaffolding for tissue growing and as uh, burn, uh, especially uh, for burns, but for for skin regeneration patches. So the engineering of skin regeneration patches from something as kind of benign as mushroom production waste, uh, the idea just fascinates me most in the technological aspect. I'd like to add a little bit to what Nicola said. I guess it's also um, a perspective from where one views the project. Um, and I guess for the sake of this conversation, you guys have in the chemistry class, um, I won't get into the, the blockchain aspect of it, but we realize for public participation, we require a large number of people to get involved in, let's say, a green movement. Um, and to achieve those ends, we are looking for collaborating with a whole host of people from budding entrepreneurs to artists, to marketeers, to essentially anyone that can help us uh, create a buzz around a movement of this nature. So from the lens at which I'm viewing the project, I find a different aspect of it fascinating, um, wherein the utility of this material could be used for all sorts of artistic endeavors and uh, innovative new technologies, which I don't think we've explored yet. Uh, a small um, expert on that is how myself and Nicola even met was on a note where he had this material and we were trying to turn it into a sculpture 
initially. And uh, my excitement to engage with the project was more uh, from a materials perspective and exploring the artistic utility for it um, with regards to the creation of a sculpture. So I guess it depends which lens you view it from, but there, um, there are aspects that um, I think- That's when it be... takes the people with the different right. worldviews to build a complete picture, I guess. <laughs> exactly. I'm actually curious to uh, this. I'll add to that, I guess there's applications in building construction and people are making furniture out of it. Someone has also made a boat out of it, by the way, mm. or mycelium. So I guess it's, there's a lot that can be done, but if the right kind of people sort of come together and they make it happen. Josh, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, you know, what would you say is like your biggest problem right now that you're trying to, uh, like so from the technical perspective, it's definitely the scale of production. So uh, the main problem with producing biosporin for now is that a large part of the production process is manual. So the machines to produce it don't really exist yet. Uh, so we've designed part of the machines. We designed for the first part that processes and homogenizes the waste and makes it usable. But everything from there up to the, the part that's kind of more established tech, which is the uh, pharmaceutical production, is done basically manually and on lab scale still. So even the chitin uh, extraction is done in a small scale bioreactor because that's where we can control the, the conditions the best for now. You know, large scale bioreactors, large scale production machines, they don't exist yet. So we are currently in the process of designing and patenting each of the, these machines one by one. The process is expensive and it takes time. So to achieve the greatest impact, we need the greatest scale. And to achieve the greater scale, we need simply time, research and money to construct the, the, the automated production process. So that's currently where we are kind of hinged on, on that part. Uh -huh. I actually have another question. Um, I know a lot of companies, especially bigger companies, have established deals with it be like a lot of packaging manufacturers, like that they know who they get their their um, styrofoam from, they know who they get their packaging material from. So has it been hard to kind of break into that and like either find businesses to work for you that um, don't have contracts that they're already kind of locked into? Or has it been hard to kind of convince companies to work with you um, because they're so used to doing it their way? So that's a really good question. It goes from one extreme to the other. So it really depends on the company itself. So we have companies which are kind of ecologically aware uh, that have products which are whose market uh, kind of expects them to be sustainably packaged. And they approach us themselves. They want to apply directly. They want to buy directly from us. We're working on them in, on developing pilots. And then we have the other extreme, which is either, uh, let's say, as you, you rightly mentioned, uh, styrofoam producers. They could also offer our product as a reseller as for someone who wants a biodegradable substitute. However, they are, I wouldn't say not interested, but kind of also aggressive towards it. I guess it's in more on a philosophical standpoint that they are... Uh, the reluctance to accept that styrofoam and similar materials will in time be replaced. So it's kind of builds up a, a resentment in them towards any kind of change. So yes, for me, it's also surprising that they wouldn't kind of want, because I, I wouldn't have a problem with offering. It would be easier for us to offer the product through others who already have an established market and established clientele, but we are meeting a lot of resistance there on one side. On the other side, there's a whole host of smaller eco-conscious companies that really want to apply the, the material. So it's really diverse. I guess it comes down to the psychology of the person who's running the business. Expanding a little bit on what Nicola said in, in uh, a real world use case, for example, in India, we are taking our samples and we're pitching them to companies to get on board um, pilots and users. Um, and the major problem that we're facing with the pitch is two things. One is they want to know how does it compare to the cost of styrofoam at present, because 
uh, a business wants to know what the, what the price uh, differential would be. And the second thing is our production capabilities, us being young. And as Nicola mentioned earlier, when we get a, I got an organization looking to buy uh, 20,000 units of our packaging, but we're not in a position where we can cater to that volume of production as yet. Uh, so it's a little bit of a catch-22 loop where we need to acquire the funds so we can scale efficiently and meet the economies of scale uh, to be able to present the product um, at, at least in a financially um, appeasing light, so to speak, right? And like Nicola mentioned earlier, the organizations that are environmentally conscious and uh, we've done certain surveys where we've come to learn that millennials and users of end products are happy to pay a higher premium if their product is sustainably packed. So the cost and the onus of making that transition also in certain cases does not lie upon the organization. Um, so I guess it's just a matter of time as to who does it quicker and cheaper. And, and that's what we're working on. Yep. I have so many questions for you guys, but unfortunately I have another class in three minutes. Oh, um, maybe nine minutes, but these students have another class and they have to go to the another building. <laughs> but do you think we could, um, if, if my students have more questions, I definitely have a lot of questions, especially pertaining to India and how you are uh, doing things. So I'm going to let you guys leave if you <clears throat> have to. And I'll just have a very quick question. Right now, India, <laughs> Titan and Hydrostone, are you transporting it or are you in at all in the production part in India yet? Or are we still focusing on the the carbon credits and um, the business side of it? So it's, it's a, that's an interesting question because uh, when we started starting the, um, when we started starting in India, uh, we were looking at what would be the right um, point to take this off from. So initially, Nicola had done the R&D, the development of the technology, and like he was mentioning earlier, uh, the issue is with scaling. We did our research and development in, um, um, let's say, under controlled, parameters in, 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 in a smaller context. And we developed the technology for it and we are functioning with autoclaves and, and, and can cater to, let's say, X amount of production volume. So the next part of it is the development of the technology that can uh, produce larger um, to scale, essentially, right? And uh, we just very recently got that technology ready and it's in the patenting process. And now we're in a position where we can license that to people um, and get more users on board. So our earlier approach in India was to set up our own production facility, copy paste what we're doing in Serbia. Uh, but we realized that since there are so many agrarian entrepreneurs already existing in the uh, agro space, it would we found it more advantageous to leverage their existing networks and availability of a funds, B raw material, and C production capabilities, uh, as opposed to acquiring the production knowledge ourselves. So the route that we're, we're presently undertaking is getting users in Punjab. Uh, there's two farmers that we're in conversations with to set up small SOMA production units, wherein we license the technology to them and we monitor the production. And parallel to that, what we are interested in doing is using the the blockchain technology to log the entire value generated from this production process, wherein we log the farm waste collection, the production within the SOMA unit, and its transport to the end user, and there where it degrades and reaches its final destination, completing the cradle to cradle circle and verifying our circular economy generation claim. So, both of these things are essentially running parallel at the present moment. But to simply answer your question, um, we are not looking at setting up our own large scale production in India just yet. We're more inclined to get people involved to license our technology. I see. But you do want to have the production to be taking place. Doesn't matter whether you guys or somebody else, you You're do absolutely. want to be taking place preferably in a village rather than in a big city because the real estate is going to be much cheaper right. and all the agricultural stuff is happening in the villages, not really in the metros. So you are basically not worrying about transporting all that agricultural waste to from one place to another. So setting up these mini units, which 
which basically will be will 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 help. One final question, and this is more of a since you mentioned the 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 disposable part of it. If you make disposable plates out of it, do you think the just the water is enough to biodegrade, or do you think it's not going to? Obviously, if you want to have a disposable plate. At least for the 30 minutes that you're eating, you don't want it to react with water. So I'm assuming that. <clears throat> you know, your, your question stated the problem in and of itself. Yeah. Our very yeah. first, our very first desire. We, we've we, we've had a lot of quite a lot of testing with the Faculty of Agriculture here in Serbia. Tested all different approaches to using it in combination with food. And the only way it can be used is with dry foods. So anything that's wet, uh, either uh, we've had also some cases, surprisingly, uh, let's say for some kinds of meat, uh, where the enzymes uh, that are inactivated in the dead mushroom tissue start uh, biting into the, 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 the food. So it's, okay. it reacts too much with, with food at this moment that, to be usable uh, as in direct contact. I was just very curious, and I'm so sorry, but I, my students have in the other class they have an exam today. No problem. So, thank I'm you, thank you a lot for the the opportunity. Thank you for your time. Uh, if there is anything else, we are always willing for a quick chat, or or you can contact us for anything else, or just a Q and A session, or whichever. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. And if you do need the. Um, I can send Burkett and mail the <clears throat> recording and then he can share it with you. <clears throat> because I this this whole class was recorded and I no should have mentioned when you entered the meeting, you already no problem. Yeah, it's fine. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <clears throat>